Hello, I'm Dr. Giovanni Rondo, host of Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit, where our goal is the improvement of our entire world, but with a particular focus on the local African-American community. We're in season two now, and during season two, we've been focused a lot on mental health, particularly during this pandemic uh, for African-Americans in particular. I have a wonderful guest today who is just an amazing mental health um, associate, just physician, and I'll let her introduce herself. Welcome, Dr. Haynes, and tell us about yourself. Well, thank you. It's it's a it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, I have a long history with St. Stephen, so um, it always really takes me back to my college days, uh, which are getting longer and further and further away. Um, but I'm Dr. Delicia Haynes. I'm the founder and CEO of Family First Health Center, which is a direct primary care practice down here in Daytona Beach, where I am, and really enjoy just providing personalized health care. Uh, there. I also help other doctors who are interested in transitioning to this style of medicine. And so uh, that is one of the things I, I really enjoy doing. And, and my, I am um, also a tremendous mental health advocate. So just finding ways, especially for physicians, but really for everyone to really love the life that they live and, and overcome risk for uh, depression and suicide. Great, great. Yes, I, me and Dr. Uh, Haynes met through her program with the DPC for Success, so direct primary care, which is absolutely amazing. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But on this season two, we focused a little bit more so on mental health and what we can do to help with the mental health of not just you know our community, um, but you know the community at large. Can you talk a little bit about your experience? Uh, with issues of, of mental health uh, uh, problems? Absolutely. Uh, and that's, it's really, uh, I think all of us, we have, we go through certain things at the time we wonder why we had to go through them. And uh, sometimes it's not about you. Uh, it's about you kind of coming through something and what kind of inspiration you can be for someone else. So uh, my story, I, uh, my senior year of high school, I moved from Maryland down to Kentucky and to Frankfort, Kentucky, to be exact, at Western Hills High School. It was a that, culture that, shock. That, yeah, that sounds like that would be a change to go from Maryland <laughs> to Kentucky, yes. It was, and I, uh, at first, you know, I came in just rearing to go, I'm gonna join every, you know, organization. And as time got on, I just, you know, my, my mood just started to really uh, be a lot lower. I had difficulty getting out of bed in the morning didn't care about like showering, which I've always been someone who cares about personal hygiene. And um, my uh, one of my teachers made us kind of write a journal. And in some of my journal interviews, I started to say things like, you know, it would be better off if I wasn't here. And lucky for me, so uh, Mrs. Bowker, my, my teacher, she recognized those signs because she'd had some students in the past who unfortunately um, you know, did die by suicide. And so she knew, and, and she had this, you know, she saw me decline, you know, over time, you know, coming in really excited. And then over time, just, you know, really um, just, you know, just my, sh my shoulders were always slumped. I was just always, I wore black everything, probably wore the same thing a couple of times. And she really just noticed and she intervened. So she actually pulled me out of another class and um, I met with her she brought my dad in um, and we all kind of met and went to see first a psychologist. And that was really just the beginning of me understanding what depression was. Um, fast forward, I went to the University of Louisville for undergrad, uh, which is where I, yeah, <laughs> which is um, also when I started attending St. Stephen's. Um, and just, I did really well when I was there. You know, I had my friend group. I pledged a sorority. I was running track. Uh, so I was, I did really well in terms of mental health. And then I went to medical school at the University of Kentucky. And I went from being this division one athlete and being super connected to all my friends to, you know, studying for eight hours a day in the, in the, in the basement of the library. Oh, big changes, uh, it sounds like. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and 
I, my second year of medical school is when I had my second major depressive episode. I was really mad because I felt like, oh, I know what this is. You know, I know how to diagnose it. I should be immune. Um, and I actually had to take time off to be treated and, um, you know, really kind of came back from there and, uh, you know, graduated and moved to Florida and did my grand rounds presentation, which we had to do as a resident on uh, uh, depression and, and suicide amongst physicians, which is when I really realized how prevalent the problem was and that I wasn't like the weak link is which I thought I was. Um, and but even then, I wasn't really an advocate and, and telling my story because I didn't want to become known as the depressed doctor, especially as I was building, you know, my own practice. And so it did take the loss of one of my best friends to suicide. And just that realization of like, I never want to be in this position where, you know, I wonder if a conversation about what I had been through might have helped somebody else that I loved. So that's when I wrote the book and really started speaking. Oh, wow. What a what a journey you have had. And thank you so much for being transparent, um, just so honest about, you know, your journey overall. I know as a healthcare provider, um, you know, it, it's, it, it can be very difficult to talk about ourselves, to turn that lens around on ourselves. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. Um, so you mentioned that some of these issues actually started when you were in high school. Mm -hmm. And so, and a teacher recognized that. So that sounds like that was very important to have, you know, an advocate really, you know, someone who recognized uh, the depression or recognized certain signs and took an interest in getting you the help that you needed. So that is, that's really great. Now, um, in terms of while you were in medical school, tell us about, you know, a little bit more about that in terms of, was it kind of like the pressures did that? Cause I remember being in medical school too, and just going through a lot of emotional, you know, changes and, and, and dealing with lots of things, but you're supposed to shoulder on and, mm -hmm. and, and that can be, you know, very, very difficult. Um, to kind of come out and, and talk about those issues when everyone else around you is, you know, uh, top of the class and and, and 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 doing very well. Or they seem to be. I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, the the one of the sad things about medicine, especially our training, is that's, you know, I, I didn't know that 30% of, you know, medical students and residents experience depression. That's a huge number. Mm -hmm. And, you we know, how do I... No, we don't. And had I known that going in, especially knowing my history, I could have been much better positioned. I could have done a lot more things to support myself as I was going through the process. Um, so, you know, I, I, in terms of, you know, the causes, there's, it's important that there's not just one thing. And I think some people, you know, want to always point to just one cause and um, it's going to be multifactorial. Uh, but there are certain risk factors and one of the risk factors is loss of relationship but we are as humans we are not meant to be isolated uh, we are meant to be in community even if you're kind of more of like an introvert mm -hmm. uh, you're you know it's, it, we are we're meant to you know really be in community and you know going to medical school you know typically you you know most of your friends don't go so you know all of your your cohorts that you were in you know college with if you're going straight from college they're kind of like, you know, getting their first apartments and their first jobs and, you know, you know, adulting money. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and we're still in school. Yes. You know, we have this like prolonged adolescence, you know, just kind of in school mm -hmm. for exceptionally long periods of time. Um, and because of the, um, the amount of study, you're only around people who are kind of going through the same thing that you are. Um, and, you know, they kind of have their own uh, challenges. So it's sometimes, especially depending on the school and the culture of the school, it might not be a really kind of um, each, you know, each yeah. everyone helping each other out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the class I came in with was definitely more gunners um, to the point that like people would circulate test answers that they knew were wrong um, or study sheets that they knew were incorrect wow. to increase their chances of um, you know, of doing well. So 
the class that I, when I took my time off, the class that I actually ended up graduating with had a very different culture and was um, really kind of a, more of a cohesive and um, just, you know, everybody was just trying to, you know, kind of get through and all become great doctors. And um, so it was a much better culture. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that soil was a lot more uh, nurturing for you, for your seed to grow mm -hmm. and to blossom into medical school. Wow, that's amazing. And I'm sure, you know, we as physicians can talk about that, but I'm sure nurses, pharmacists, dentists, and just other healthcare workers can also talk about some of the stressors, you know, when it comes to, you know, their education and just not just in the healthcare profession, but, you know, just overall. And I think during this pandemic, I think because, you know, the focus on healthcare is, is maybe a little bit more so, and people are, you know, looking at um, maybe some of the healthcare uh, fields, you know, much more so just being more transparent is very important for us. So thank you for that, you know, honesty, that transparency. And, you know, what I like to say is that we can't fix a problem that we won't face. Mm -hmm. So facing, you know, mental um, issues, no matter where we are and what we're, we're doing is vitally important for our overall health, for the health of the mind, body and spirit, which is, of course, the, the, the theme of this show. Um, now, just kind of moving on, we also talk about not just depression, but also other um, mental disorders like anxiety, like post-traumatic stress disorder. And so one of the things that we've talked about um, during this season is how, as African-Americans, we have gone through quite a bit in terms of just our history. What have you found in some of your data or your research that, um, you know, just kind of talks about that within the African-American community and what we've gone through? Uh, well, I mean, there's just, there's so much, um, there's so much trauma. Mm -hmm. And even the trauma that we personally haven't experienced, you know, it is also, you know, learned in terms of generational, generationally. Um, I was actually just talking about my own experience um, not too long ago because when I was in the seventh grade I was sitting on my grandparents porch and my grandfather who was an amazing man he was president of the local NAACP, NAACP chapter had his master's in a time when very few people had that and he's sitting on his front porch and at this point he has dementia and so wow. his recollection of past events is very strong but you know, of current ones, not so much. And he was reliving some of his past. And what he was reliving was um, that his father, you know, had to travel for work, and um, a man uh, would come to the house and would um, abuse his mother. And he one day he climbed up into uh, the you know the farmhouse and he with a shotgun and he was just waiting for the guy to come, and because he wanted to end you know that abuse. And for some reason, you know, the guy didn't come that day and the guy never came again. And as he's telling this story, like tears are literally dripping from his eyes. And, you know, my seventh grade self, I'm sitting, I'm sitting at his feet. And what I made this story mean was that if I, if I go into debt, because the person that was coming was coming to collect a debt, um, that if I ever go into debt, it means that someone can rape me. Um, that's what I, that's what I made it mean. And, you know, and, uh, so I had this very strong, uh, desire to never be in debt. Um, almost a, uh, unhealthy desire not to be in debt because of what I made it mean because of not the trauma that I had experienced personally. Um, you know, I saw this hero of mine, you know, crying as he's reliving this, you know, this story. Uh, but I just think that kind of, you know, that kind of, kind of you know, a pass down you know trauma does ex it, it exists so much and uh really does affect us even if we aren't always conscious of it wow that is such a powerful story and that's one story um that that you've experienced just and, and i'm just thinking just imagine all the stories that you know are not told or are just so deep or maybe even you know you can't even bring them forth anymore um, to the point where you just, you know, they're not even, you know, you can't discuss them or, you know, it, it's very pretty deep. So, wow. 
Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So um, in terms of with um, just depression, just overall, we talk a little bit about the treatment for depression, um, for anxiety. And a lot of times, you know, we discuss medications. Of course, there's hundreds of different medications. And a lot of people don't like the idea of being put on medications. Um, I know as a physician, I do prescribe them. There's lots of different ones, but I prescribe other things too. I prescribe things like, you know, sitting down and talking with someone, therapy, um, journaling. You had mentioned that uh, you did some journaling. And so if you could kind of discuss not only what you prescribe for some of your patients dealing with depression, but also some of the things that you may also utilize as well. Absolutely. And and just like you, I take that really, you know, holistic approach to treating and, and, and maintaining your mood. So I always bring in all five senses. And, you know, I tell people to, you know, even if we are using, you know, a pill, and it's important that we don't attach any shame to medication. I think especially when it comes to mental health, there's just this, there's this shame of needing to be on something. And um, I, you know, that's just a it's a, it keeps a lot of people from getting the help that they need and that they would benefit from. Um, depression, it's very treatable. And so, you know, 70, 80% of people who are treated get better. And so it's really important that we acknowledge that and just really, you know, look at all the different modalities that we can use. And, and none of them are in a vacuum. So we never just give someone a pill and, you know, say, don't do anything else. You know, if you can combine that with therapy, you know, with talking to someone is really, it's really great. Um, and then, like I was saying, mentioning, I use all five senses. So when you think of, you know, the sense of hearing there, when you are struggling with depression, all of your thoughts and are negative, uh, or mo most of your thoughts are negative and your self-talk is really defeating. It's like you're getting beat up by yourself every day. Um, so it's really important that you counter that or that you import some positivity, whether that's through music, you know, I listen to gospel, uh, whether it's podcasts, you know, affirmations, whatever it is so that you can bring that in, um, sight, you know, there are certain things that you look at that just make you smile. If it's puppies, babies, whatever your thing is, making sure that that is around you, um, touch, you know, you have to be really careful about who you're in contact with, who's in your sphere and be really, um, just pay attention to how people make you feel or how you feel when you're around them, kind of shifts in their energy, that sort of thing. Um, so that about, I'm sorry, you're so, when you mentioned touch, so not just the physical touch, but just someone touching you in terms of how they speak to you. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, who you're in contact with. Um, you know, who is who is physically around you, who is influencing you, mm -hmm. uh, so not just how things kind of feel against your body and like, you know, that sort of touch, but literally, who are you keeping in touch with? And wow. also recognizing that there are some people that need to be loved from a distance, and that's fine. Uh, there are certain times that, you know, if, if I, um, I'll look at my phone after it rings and, um, you know, look at that name and I'm like, hmm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I love you, but no. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, thought of it like that. That is that's wonderful. That's that's I'm writing this down because I'm trying to make sure that I, you know, utilize those five touches and not just for myself but for patients. So, but is there also tactile touch that actually will help in terms of with um, depression or mood disorders? Well, there's definitely. Um, and, and this is very individual, you know, so certain people like certain things in terms of, of the tactiles. Uh, my staff, I have like, it's really kind of a handkerchief with like a bunch of different um, designs, buttons, all types of things on it. If my staff sees me have that in my hand, they know to leave me alone. <laughs> Uh, and, um, you know, so they think of it as my blankie, but really, you know, it's just like, I'm thinking, I'm, you know, I'm trying to kind of, you know, come off the cliff or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm trying to calm down and, um, you know, it's kind of like the, like the medicine balls that people sometimes kind of, you know, use in their hand. Um, those things can really be very distracting. And sometimes when you're dealing with anxiety, distraction can be the best thing that you can do is, is that, you know, your heart rate and everything is going up. Some people will take a rubber band and snap it um, just to kind of have something physical that really kind of helps them to 
kind of change, they would shift their, their state a little bit. Wow. That was a great idea. So the, yeah, so I never thought about the whole uh, touch, you know, who you're in touch with, but we do have like the little squeezy balls that we'll have when, you know, especially if someone is having, you know, a procedure that is uncomfortable or having blood work. So we'll ask them to squeeze that ball to kind of take that, that, uh, that, that attention away. So what about the other senses, the smell and the taste? Right. So taste we have to be careful of because when we are stressed, our, you know, our natural go-to is going to be sugar, basically. It's going to be something that breaks down into sugar, quick energy, because when you're in that fight, flight, or freeze, uh, your body knows it, that it needs to be able to fight. So it needs, you know, a quick source of energy. So you, you will crave, you know, potato chips and wine and pizza and, you know, all of those, you know, kind of quick sources of energy. Oh. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but, oh, well. but a little, small amount of dark chocolate actually is supposed to be somewhat therapeutic for stress. Small it, amount yeah. of this. And the quality matters. Yes. Uh, it is so, um, uh, I actually have a patient who's a Belgian chocolatier, which I didn't even know was like, I mean, I knew it was a thing, but like that like, really was her job, which is amazing. <laughs> and she was, so she was educating me on, you know, the different types of chocolate and how no chocolate in the U.S. like kind of meets her standards. Um, so she had to actually go to school for that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Like how wonderful is that school? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I'll have to look that up for you know, retirement <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. And then, and then smell. Smell. Yeah. So the beautiful thing about smell is that you don't get to overthink it. So it really goes kind of straight to your brainstem and you react. So there are certain smells, you know, aromatherapy is, you know, um, very well known. So there are certain smells that are kind of associated with certain things. Uh, but the smell, when, when I'm talking about kind of, you know, treating depression or kind of helping, you know, kind of um, lift and maintain your mood, there are smells that you have an association with from childhood, something that's positive. And so as soon as you smell that, and we've all had that experience of you've been somewhere and you smell something that just kind of reminds you of home or a place of comfort and you instantly feel a little bit better. Yeah. So really paying attention to what those are for you. For me, it's cherry chapstick. And I literally have cherry chapstick yeah. everywhere. <laughs> so that if I, you know, just kind of need a quick kind of pick me up or something, I will just, you know, uh, take out my cherry chapstick and I'm instantly like back in the third grade on the bus, queen of the universe. Like you can't tell me anything. And we all need to have days like that. Wow. That is amazing. Thank you for that. Now, we are in, so you, you talk about being transported. So some of the things that I think about are um, people who have, um, who've passed on and you have a certain connection or a certain song or a smell or whatnot. So, you know, we think of that in terms of with grief, maybe like a sad thing, but is that something that we should try to go for or should not when we're, you know, dealing with, you know, grief? Well, I think when it's, when it comes to grief, it's really important well, in general, kind of not to like should on ourselves because there, it's just not a positive or pulling forward um, type of thing. Um, but just recognizing one that everyone grieves differently. And so, you know, how you choose to honor someone's life or how you uh, react could be very different than the person, you know, another person that, who also, you know, loved them dearly. And to really just not try to make yourself right or wrong, uh, that I, I love the saying that emotions aren't right or wrong, they're just real. Um, and there was uh, one that my pastor said that um, emotions are like children, you can't let them drive, but you can't put them in the trunk either. And I thought that was great. I'm gonna have to write that down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So we we have to acknowledge them, and you know, grief, especially in the beginning, you know, it's just kind of like wave after wave after wave, and then over time, the waves still come. They're just they're spread further apart, uh, and so really just acknowledging that that you have lost someone. Um, and on that same note, we talk about grieving the people that we have loved, but we also sometimes grieve the experiences we wished we, we thought we would have. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about um, women who have miscarried, uh, you know, once you find out that you're pregnant in your mind, you, you know, you are a mother, you've got uh, plans, you've got anniversary dates, you've, you know, you've got birthday dates kind of already set up in your mind. 
Um, and so it's it's very uh, very natural and and to you know to grieve all the things that you wished would have happened uh, with that child. It happens with relationships. You know, you That's you grieve, like but you relationships too. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Now, I, and I brought up the whole grief um, issue just because there's a lot of us who are grieving, uh, whether it's the loss of a loved one or, you know, maybe a relationship. Um, and, and just this whole pandemic has caused to me the whole world to grieve a life that we or a world that we saw different. And that is just a very different, you know, a reality for a lot of us. So in terms of just this pandemic, what have you seen in terms of, you know, your patient population, what you've experienced yourself uh, with this COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, it's been really hard. Um, you know, so uh, one of the beautiful things about direct primary care is you form such strong patient relationships with, you know, the people that you take care of. And, um, so when you lose someone, it is it is like losing family member. And mm -hmm. so we lost um, two patients to suicide. And um, one of those individuals had been a patient of mine for 12 years. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. And um, so it was, you know, it's just been, it's been, ex it's been exceptionally just, you know, trying. There's so many people even, you know, today that we are, we're used to kind of keeping up with blood pressure and we're used to keeping up with diabetes. And right now the most, the thing that I'm keeping up with the most is people's mental health. Yes. And you know yes. how I've, I've had to involuntarily admit some people. And unfortunately our hospital is not really adequately staffed for that at the moment. Um, so it's just a really, it's just a really tough place to be. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? So, with direct primary care, I'm glad you uh, mentioned that. You have a closer relationship um, because you can spend more time, you know, with your patients, and you don't have the huge, huge patient load um, that you normally would. So, do you feel like being a, a direct primary care physician has helped, you know, you just to kind of manage um, throughout the the pandemic better than if you were with a, a much larger group and needed to see tons and tons of patients. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, even just from a, from a business standpoint, so many practices shuttered or closed because people weren't coming in. And, and if you weren't set up to do telemedicine, you know, that, that pivot was not easy. Uh, with direct primary care, we already were including telemedicine in our service. So um, from a, from a, a pure business standpoint, the, the business did fine. You know, our, our income didn't go down. We were able to work with people who had lost their jobs and, um, you know, let them know that you're going to continue to have health care. <laughs> you know, we will work with you, uh, which is nice when you are your own, you know, when you get to make those decisions that so you don't have to uh, feel like you're turning people away because, you know, some administrator is saying that we, you know, we can't do this. Um, yes, it is still a business and you have to run it as one, but it's nice to be able to, you know, be able to make those decisions. Um, so I, you know, direct primary care definitely practices um, did much better from a business standpoint, and then also from a just an operation standpoint and taking care of patients. We were just already in a situation where we, we were able to really meet people where they where they are. Um, again, like you mentioned, spend a lot of time with people, and when it comes to mental health, it's a it's a it's a it's a subject that takes a lot of trust for people to bring up and trust mm -hmm. takes time uh so if you're rushing someone and you know it's obvious that your hands on the door and you're just waiting for them to stop speaking so that you can run out um they're not going to bring up things that you know have been bothering them but they just you know maybe don't feel comfortable talking about so that relation having a relationship-based medicine is important in general but truly important during this pandemic Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that I love with uh, my practice, which is kind of modeled like yours with the direct primary care with Global MD. It just really allows us to spend more time. And and with that time, you basically allowing more trust to be developed, you know, between the you know patient or between the person and the physician. So 
I think that that's really the best way to really practice medicine is, is, is spending more time overall. So that's, that's really great. Now, um, anything else in terms of just with our community, things that you would advise or things that you see specifically for our community to help us through, not only with this pandemic, but also with some of the racial issues that have gone on. And then now as we kind of open up, because there's oh, just still so many questions, um, things that we can do. Well, I think that peace of mind is a beautiful thing. And so that's one of the beauties of having relationship-based medicine is that the questions that are on your mind and on your heart, you're able to pick up the phone and talk to your doctor about, um, you know, like you don't have to just call your hairdresser or, you know, someone else, like you can, you can talk to someone who's probably best positioned to be able to answer that particular question. Um, and I think, you know, just um, in terms of, you know, things opening up and, you know, again, you, um, we still know that it's you know still out there it's not going anywhere um you know it's now become you know one of the circulating viruses so um mm -hmm. that you don't have to go back to doing everything that the way you know the, that it was um and you know it's fine to continue to kind of protect yourself as you're kind of going you know back out uh so really but you know just making sure that you're doing what makes sense for, for you and your family and looking out for others as well uh, I, I actually I love that there's a heightened awareness around uh, hygiene, you know, things that we've always been telling people like wash your hands, yes. you know, <laughs> um, suddenly became really popular, but we've all, you know. You know, it's, it is, it's amazing to me how, gosh, something that, you know, we have actually been saying for years, you know, wash your hands frequently, cover your mouth mm -hmm. uh, when you cough or, you know, cough into your, your elbow. Um, you know, basic things are now, those are the things to absolutely do. I think, you know, just wearing a mask, that's the only really new, new thing. Um, but it's amazing how these things that, you know, I think, you know, we've all as physicians have advised our patients to do. So it's uh, interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Haynes. So with the Healthy Mind, Body and Spirit show, we talk a lot about just different things to do and what our community can do and how we can be better overall. We talk about all kinds of different topics. So like we mentioned before, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And so we've discussed that today. But what we like to do is not just talk about it, we like to be about it. So what do you, Dr. Haynes, do to optimize your own health? So, you know, it's really about getting the basics, you know, so nutrition. Uh, so making sure that you're getting lots of vegetables. We know that inflammation in the brain is, uh, you know, a huge problem. And so, you know, trying to do more of an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, a lot of the neurotransmitters that we need to feel good are protein-based. So making sure that we've got high quality proteins in our diet and lots and lots of vegetables. Okay. Um, now, now you're saying um, we, but you're saying specifically yourself. What do you oh, yeah. I, this is okay. me. Yeah, me. Okay. I say, yeah, I speak to myself in third person, too. Okay. But uh, <laughs> no, this is this is what I do. So I, I do eat, uh, you know, kind of like a, I, I make sure I get high quality proteins in. I can tell my mood is different when I haven't sleep is. Uh, so last night I didn't I didn't do so hot in this uh, department because I was uh, trying to finish a, a book that I'm writing. Uh, so I'm actually writing a journal which is a planning journal which is going to have kind of all of the, it's, it's sometimes you create what you know you need yeah. uh, so you know i wanted to be able to put everything in terms of my personal goals my financial goals my relationship goals onto you know one page and to be able to kind of like day by day making sure that my priorities aren't getting kind of sidetracked by the to-do list and the agenda and the you know the uh the uh, the inbox uh, so I was kind of putting some of the, the finishing touches on that. And so um, Daybreakers, the inspirational planning journal will be coming out you know, soon. Um, but sleep, <laughs> usually I'm, I get eight hours and um, you know that my room is, it is dark, it is quiet. My neighbor does have 10 dogs right now, which is a problem. And so I've just started saying, um, you know, Alexis, play rain sounds so that I can drown them out and still get my, you know, my, my sleep in. 
Um, I'm very cognizant about who I spend my time with. Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing about owning my own practice is I get to make the hiring and firing decisions. Uh, so I, you know, I get to really um, impact the or influence, you know, what kind of energy is, is in my office. So it's really important that to the extent that you can, that you do that. But that's one of the things that I really like to do. Movement every day, um, you know, when that kind of that angst kind of builds up, we need a physical expression of that. And so my mental health walk, which usually is sunset. Uh, so I love to see sunset over a body of water. So I will be driving around trying to find what body of water I'm going to, you know, pause and, you know, take in the sunset. Uh, it's just, it's my favorite time of day. It actually takes me back to being on the track at, at Louisville, you know, because we would be out there until the sunset. And yes, so um, it was, you know, it just really takes me back to those beautiful times. So those are some of the things that I do. Wow, that's amazing. So let's see, movement, nutrition, sleep, and who you're with. That's what Dr. Haynes does to help with her mental health. And this has been a wonderful, wonderful episode of Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit. Um, where we focus on improving our entire world with a particular goal with the African-American community. Thank you for joining us today. Be well.